Shabbat Shalom. It's always exciting, intriguing, intriguing, whatever you want to say, to watch how we work together as human beings and how totally different we are. And, uh, you know, it's, it's part of, like Greg mentioned, where Yeshua says he prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And we all know that's a challenge because we're so unique. And on the other hand, you don't necessarily unite well with people just like you. In fact, usually that's the worst. Uh, and, and listening to the, the different responses and, and how we operate, it, it's good because one of the things you find out is there's a richness to life when you don't assume everyone sees it the way you do. And that people are very different. And, and I know, you know, we talk about sharing, which is an obligation the Lord puts on us, but that really doesn't tell us exactly how that happens. But we are to give a reason for the hope. And uh, one of the things you'll find, that they, when they do surveys of people, the number one fear is public speaking which completely doesn't make any sense to me. I'm a compulsive communicator. I was like this when I was little, and I did not like public speaking. I remember what Greg said when they made us do two-minute talks. <laughs> I thought I would perish. But the fact that someone likes to talk in front doesn't mean they have something to say. It means they like to talk. <laughs> and that's one of the things you find out. But you'll also find out that there are people that really have something to say that don't want to, that they're reluctant. Or, and so to create an environment where we nurture each other, allow each other to make mistakes, but that we truly listen to each other is critical in forming community with the Messiah. And, you know, reading through Deuteronomy, and we're on Deuteronomy 13 and 14 today, I think anybody that's read this book, Devarim is what the Jews call it, words, you can summarize this book so easy. Obey my commandments, don't sin, and you'll be blessed. Sin, and it's going to go bad. And so you, you find, well, what, is the, what is the issue of sin? And I don't know about the rest of you, when you look at the country we have today, our definition of sin is so changed that it's almost like you're not allowed to call anything a sin, that if it feels good to you, do it. And, and yet we all know that doesn't work either. What's the proper approach? And I'd like you to go to Deuteronomy 13, and it's a short chapter, I'm going to read it, because I want you to hear how God puts this, and my first reaction is horror, if you want to know the truth. And yet I kind of get it, and, and I want to share and, and listen to you too. How do you approach sin? When, Am I overstating when I say that if we no longer sinned, all our problems would go away? Yep. What would happen if there was no more sin? I don't think we'll ever find that out. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a problem we need to worry about. But when you look at the, the story in the Garden of Eden, what brought sin into the world? What brought cataclysms? If I read the biblical story correctly, we frequently say, well, how could a just God do this when everything we don't like, if you believe the Bible, came from sin? Now, does that mean you sinned and it happened to you? No, we all know that there's a fair amount of pain in life that comes from other people's sin. <laughs> or what you're born into. But, but listen to this, and, and I want to talk a little bit about it because... I think we have some examples of how not to do this, and yet not because people do it wrong does it mean we shouldn't do it. And I, I'm saying confronting sin, identifying sin. Does it work for us as a society to say no such thing as sin? If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, in other words, this is a prophet that makes an accurate predict prediction. 
concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow Yahweh your God and fear him. And you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against Yahweh your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which Yahweh your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. All right, so here's our first third of the chapter. If there's an accurate prophet, a prophet who predicts accurately what's going to happen, and yet his message is to follow other gods, what do you do with him? Did you hear? What do you do with him? You kill him. Is that right? That's, that's the requirement. Okay, so first, a prophet who even if he gives good, accurate prophecies, if he counsels idolatry, you kill him. If your brother, your mother's son, or your son or daughter, or the wife you cherish, or your friend who is as your own soul, entice you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, whom neither you nor your fathers have known, of the gods of the peoples who are around you, near you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other end. You shall not yield to him or listen to him, and your eyes shall not pity him, nor shall you spare or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. I told you I didn't like it. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. You shall, so you shall stone him to death because he has sought to seduce you from Yahweh your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid and will never again do such a wicked thing among you. So the first one is a prophet who counsels you to follow idols. The next is a close friend, spouse, family member who secretly says, let's serve other gods. And in this case, he is, this person is to be killed, and you're to cast the first stone. Now we get to the last one. Verse 12. If you hear in one of your cities, which Yahweh your God is giving you to live in, anyone saying that some worthless men have gone out from among you and have seduced the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods whom you have not known. Then you shall investigate and search out and inquire thoroughly. If it is, a true, if it is true and the matter established, that this abomination has been done among you. If you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, I said if, it's you shall utterly strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it and all that is in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword. Then you shall gather all its booty into the middle of its open square and burn the city and all its booty with fire as a whole burnt offering to Yahweh your God. And it shall be a ruin forever. It shall never be rebuilt. Nothing from that which is put under the ban shall cling to your hand. In other words, all this is devoted to the Lord. It's to be burned. You're not to take anything. This is just like Jericho. Nothing is to be... Uh, in order that Yahweh may turn from his burning anger and show mercy to you and have compassion on you and make you increase, just as he has sworn to your fathers. If you will listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, keeping all his commandments, which I am commanding you today, and doing what is right in the sight of Yahweh your God. So we have three different situations, a prophet, intimate friend or family member, or a city. And in every case, when someone or some group counsels you to follow other gods, your response is to be to destroy. And, and you know, again, my first reaction is, whew, this sounds awful. And I would point something out to you. As far as I know, this was never done. We have no record of this ever being done. It's definitely here that it's part of the Torah. If you believe the Bible, who is speaking in Deuteronomy 13? It's God. This isn't Moses. This is God. So how do you handle this? That, the first thing it, that it does bring to me is we probably don't have the same view of sin that God does. Would you guess that's true? 
Because if you're doing something, it's because somehow you've made a treaty with it. You, it's okay. It's not that bad. And Yeshua talks this way sometimes, doesn't he? I think I mentioned last time, what did Yeshua say to do with your eye if it causes you to sin? The NIV, I think, says gouge it out. Some say uh, put it out. Then also, what does he say to do with your right hand if it causes you to sin? Cut it off and cast it from you. And now, did he, was he really speaking that he wanted you to do this physically? No. And this is one of the things you have to realize when you read Torah, that you know, people think you can just read the Bible for yourself and get the meaning. No, you can't. I'm sorry. You need the Holy Spirit, and it helps to know what is being said. Just as in all the instructions about leprosy are much more about evil speech and slander than they are skin disease. And this is talking about, I believe, now you're getting my opinion here, the attitude to sin. Who said this? This is a question, and I'll bet you all can get the answer. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Who said that? Everybody here knows. That was Yeshua, that was Jesus. Then he went on to say, For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. This sounds just like Deuteronomy 13, doesn't it? What's he saying? What, what is the message? He who loves father or mother more than me is what? Not worthy of me. You know all these. I mean, I am not talking about esoteric scripture that you're not aware of. You're aware of these. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. These are really stark. They present a decision. And they talk about your and my attitude to sin. How do I effectively combat sin? I've shared with you before, I believe everything it talks about in the land is talking about you taking care of what's in you. What's in you, you need to be ruthless with it. What's in you, you can't allow it to raise its head because if you do, it will destroy you. Very much the way that I can have all kinds of bacteria outside of my body. I can have them on my skin. I can actually eat a lot of them but I can't stick it in a syringe and inject it into me. It will kill me. I can't take it in. When they do surgery on you, they do the absolute best they can to glove up, to scrub. They put on sterile gowns because they know that where they're going in you, you're vulnerable and the least little bit of infection can kill you. There has to be, and yet, you don't need to handle the stuff on the outside of you with the same relentlessness you do inside of you. Go ahead, Greg. I mentioned to you yesterday that, um, an instance in what is in Exodus 32 where Moses is coming down off of the mountain. They've heard a noise down in the camp. And Moses says something very interesting. He says, who is on the Lord's side and let him come to me. And, and the Levites come and stand and so apparently the Levites were not involved with the idol worship at that time. That's Certainly not those. Certain. But anyway, at that, after Moses uh, invited them, whoever, to come to where he was standing and be on the Lord's side, he told all the Levites to take a sword, go throughout the entire camp, and kill brothers. All those involved in the idol worship. It's exactly like Deuteronomy 13. And, I mean, they sliced up 3,000 people. I can't even imagine what that would be like. But that was pretty ruthless to take a sword and hack somebody. Yeah, and I don't know about the rest of you. When I read this kind of stuff, I'm like, ugh, what is, what, what's going on here? And, and what's the message? What, you know, because the word is to transform me. Now I'm, going to, now I'm going to read you some other scriptures and I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example in a, in a certain sense this isn't fair 
this example I'm going to give you. You might be aware of it. We have an example in our culture of a church that takes these things literally. And they're disgusting. My opinion. It leaked out. But who said this? Love your enemies, do good to them that persecute you. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. But love your enemies and do good and land expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. He also, the same person said, he who lives by the sword, what? Die by the sword. How do you put these together? They're not in contradictions. The same person is saying this. The same person is saying, I didn't come to bring peace. Then he comes and he says, love your enemies. Lend to them, even expect nothing back. He said, if you really want to be a father, a son of the Most High, you'll love your enemies. I always find this interesting because when you get to know people, we really get to know each other quite well in the community context in the House of Aaron. And we get to where we know families. And one of the things, if you knew the Conrads, there are certain traits the Conrads had. And you, I remember watching Kathy, who had a wit as sharp as a razor and quick, and I'd say, That's, she's a daughter of her dad. I could see her father in her. Well, God says that when he watches me loving my enemies, I look like him. So how do I fit this with these other things? And yet you'll never hear Yeshua saying, make peace with sin. He says, make peace with sinners. There's a huge difference. And the church today is struggling with this. Paul, in Romans 12, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind. You all know this. When I was a child here at Estelle, everybody had to memorize Romans 12. I remember thinking it would be impossible, but we, we finally did. But I think you'll remember this. Do not be overcome by evil, but what? Overcome evil with good. Isn't it amazing? All of you know these things. You know them. I don't have to tell you. So how does that look if we're going to destroy the idolatry in us? Now there's a, a church in Kansas, and I took this from their website. This is what they say. This is not me. The meaning of God hates fags. God hates fags, though elliptical is a profound theological statement which the world needs to hear more than it needs oxygen, water, and bread. The three words fully expounded show the absolute sovereignty of God in all matters whatsoever, the doctrine of reprobation or God's hate involving eternal retribution or the everlasting punishment of most of mankind in hell. Are you feeling good? The, certainly, the certainty that all impenitent sodomites under the elegant metaphor of fags as the contraction of faggots, fueling the fires of God's wrath, are you feeling lifted up yet, will inevitably go to hell. The only lawful sexual connection is the marriage bed. All other sex activity is whoremongery and adultery which will damn the soul forever in hell. Decadent, depraved, degenerate, and debauched America, having bought the lie that it's okay to be gay, has thereby changed the truth of God into a lie and now worships and serves the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. But the word of God abides. Better to be a eunuch if the will of God be so and make sure of heaven. Better to be blind or lame than to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Finally, abstain, you fools. What about this is not working? Can you see how somebody could read Deuteronomy 13 and Exodus 32 and come up with this? There are several problems with this. And I'm going to talk briefly about a girl that left. One of the most powerful things. If you like TED Talks, go listen to the TED Talk by, and we have to, Megan Phelps Roger. But in our ruthlessness for sin, you'll never find anywhere that God says to be ruthless with sinners. 
In the Old Covenant, there is a difference. Now, I'm, I'm not one of these that thinks the Old Covenant and the New Covenant are fundamentally different, because most ways they're not. The New Covenant is the Old Covenant written on the heart. But I would just ask you right now, when David slept with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, sent Uriah to the front lines to get him killed, and lied, how many capital sins, according to Torah, did he commit? A bunch. We all agree? What did God do with David? He forgave him. What's wrong with God? See, if you don't read the whole story, this is Megan Phelps Rogers. Before she could read, when she was like three years old, four years old, she was picketing and she was carrying a sign, gays deserve death. She grew up believing that life was an epic spiritual battle, that we, Westboro Baptist Church, are different, we're other, we're not like the other people. And the number one job they had was to let people know they were deceived. And she went on Twitter spouting these same beliefs, her hatred, her belief system. Interestingly enough, she bumped into some Twitter people that kept responding to her, that kept engaging her in conversation. And they would listen to her and respond, but they didn't hate her. She didn't know how to handle it because she had been told that we're the only good people, they're all bad people. This eventually led to conversations which she had never had. And here's one of the things I would point out politically, religiously. If you have opponents you can't have a conversation with, then you have opponents that don't, you don't think deserve the love of God. If you can't have a conversation with them, if they're so far side out the pale, that was good. <laughs> far side out the pale. Interpret that one. If they don't deserve empathy, if they don't deserve care, this is what Westboro Baptist Church does. Now, do you, are you aware that the Christian church does this with people? The Christian church has people we will not engage in conversation. They're not worth it. They're not worthy of it. Does this look like Yeshua? Does it look like God? You think about that. And yet, we see this relentless thing that says, do not compromise with evil. Anyway, she got into conversation with these people. And she finally kind of connected with this Israeli Jew. And, you know, and somehow they actually shared things with each other. And he came to her at one of these demonstrations while she's carrying a sign, God hates Jews. And he gives her a Middle Eastern dish and she shares kosher chocolate with him. And this is a rich picture. What's this doing to her worldview? This Jew is actually doing spiritual warfare. Because she's carrying the sign he disregards. She's a person. Eventually, the friends on Twitter sowed so many seeds of doubt. For one thing, they weren't the demons she'd been told they were. And she finally became uncomfortable with exulting in others' tragedies and doing demonstrations at funerals. Did, have you ever seen the, the demonstrations these guys would do at funerals? I don't even want to repeat what's on a lot of the signs, but basically they said <clears throat> all the people, military men and women that we were losing in war was because of our uh, sin and particularly homosexuality. And, and I think there's a reason why they so concentrate on homosexuality, and it's because this is a sin the church has decided is not a sin. We've decided we're going to make this one okay. That doesn't sound like Deuteronomy 13 or Exodus 32. But this hatred thing, it's not working either. And she just came to this place she could no longer justify being happy with other people's pain. You know, I, I love what happens when they bring to David the news that Saul is dead. And Saul has been trying to kill David for 20 years. And he cries out, and he says, don't tell this in Gath, don't spell it out in Ashkelon. The beloved of the Lord have fallen. And I'm like, whoa, David. 
No wonder he's a man after God's heart. And even when his own son, who is trying to kill him, he finds out that Absalom is dead, what does David say? Absalom, my son Absalom. We, we misconstrue. God does not exult in our tragedy. His heart breaks from the tragedy that comes through our sin. That's, In 2012, she and her sister left. And reading the, I mean, listening to her, and she, it's only a 15-minute talk, so she doesn't have time to go into depth. But it was this wrenching. It's the same thing you, you hear when you talk to people that leave polygamy. It's so hard to leave this nest. And, and when she was having the problems, she was trying to stay with her family. And it was sad. There's ten, she has 10 siblings. And she found out she didn't want to leave her family, but they would not let her leave this lifestyle without breaking from the family. And so you start to see what Yeshua says. If you're not willing to leave father and mother, sometimes you have to. She wrote an apology, and she, she, knows, she knew that wasn't enough. She'd spent her whole life picketing and hating and... Uh, she asked for forgiveness and she started to give others the benefit of the doubt and she realized that one of the real things that destroyed the Westboro Baptist Church is they told you that you knew what other people's motivation was that you couldn't engage in a conversation and give them the benefit of the doubt. We do this in politics, we do this in religion, it's evil. It needs to be called out. If you're not listening to your opponent you've decided they no longer deserve your love or your empathy. So I'm not saying it's always easy. I love this because her Jewlicious friend, as she calls it, brought her to the home of a rabbi that she'd earlier picketed with the sign, your rabbi is a whore. It's the kind of love that comes out of the Westboro Baptist Church. And she found herself talking theology with the rabbi and helping him in his kosher kitchen. And the story is wonderful because it's love and acceptance that breaks down what's in her, not people telling her that she's wrong. She saw that. She discovered the tremendous relief to let go of the judgment and the hatred. But I like what she said now. She says, America is struggling with the same thing now. We, I'm almost quoting her word for word here. We retreat to our bunkers and come out to lob rhetorical grenades at the other side. Such a beautiful description. And then listen to this. No nuance, no complexity, no humanity. When everything gets cut and dried and black and white, you should be terrified because people are complex. Good people do bad things and bad people do good things. There is nuance. There is complexity. There is humanity. And yet, we can't leave the scriptures that tell us to hate sin. Because sin is what gives us the pain and the trouble we have now. She mentioned something I said earlier, that we determine who deserves empathy. This so characterizes the political scene in America today. I'm a weird person in that I have very liberal friends and very conservative friends. And I enjoy talking to both. But I noticed I've got a liberal friend that lives in Alaska, and this, he's a wonderful Christian man. But every day on, t not Twitter, because I don't even know what Twitter is, every day on Facebook, he's got at least 10 posts about how Trump was ruining the country. Some of them are reasonably accurate, a lot of them are just hopeless. I have some people, a girl named Sandy, I won't tell you her last name, who is, worships the ground Trump walks on. She puts out just as big a nonsense. But here's the thing about both of them. They're drawing lines that can't be crossed. They're not talking to each other. They're not giving the other person the chance to be human. If in sharing the gospel, we're so right, and I love another, I, I, I love another comment she made, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through these four things that she said. She says, we can change this it's easy, but it's very hard. She says, don't assume bad intent. I have spent the last 20 years in the Messianic movement saying, stop assuming bad intent with the people you don't agree with. 
Don't study church history and look at the church fathers as men who wanted to take us into idolatry because they didn't. But if you go with that slant, you end up with the crap you see today. And if you don't believe it happens on the other side, read what the church says about Jews. I just got a thing here a couple of weeks ago. The Road to Zion, written and this whole movie put on by this Christian that calls Jews the synagogue of Satan, that they're hopelessly deceived, that you should never even talk to them. And it's like, this assuming bad intent is just as wrong if your theology is good as if it isn't. You don't. Who knows the intent of other people's heart? God. Do you know what it says in Scripture that you're not to take over what is God's job? That means you don't judge a per, you know, person's eternal destination and you don't know what's in their heart. Even when you're sure you know, you don't. And she, and she mentions for her, it was her Twitter fan, Twitter fans, I'm having a good time today. Let's change that to fiend. <laughs> her Twitter friends that believed in her basic value and goodness. These are the people that changed her while she was spouting God hates fags, your rabbi is a whore, Jews are whatever she said about it. I mean, the kind of stuff they didn't assume where this was coming from. And then she says, ask questions, and this is so important. If you want to reach peace people with the good news of what Yeshua has done for you, be willing to ask questions why they oppose, and truly listen. See, this is where I have a problem. I'll, you ask the question, then I'm already formulating my response. Listen to people. It bridges the disconnect between sides. It lets the other side know that there's a signal that's being heard. It's not easy. It's easy and it's really hard. Stay calm. <laughs> and she's, this is another thing. She said at Westboro, it was all but a tenet that my rightness excuses and justifies my rudeness. It doesn't. See, I pick on Westboro because they're the epitome of what's awful when we don't handle the gospel correctly, when we don't look like Yeshua, look like Jesus. Stay calm. Don't, don't let things get out of control. This is when people get hurt. And she said the great thing about her was Twitter was online. So it gave her the buffer of time and space. She would be so angry at the things people were saying, but with time, she could sit and think and internalize. And it, you know, it's, we all pick on uh, online communication. There are some great things about it. Then she said, make sure you make the argument. In other words, say why you believe what you believe, because she said this is what her friends on Twitter did. They closed the argument and saying, what you're doing isn't helpful. What you're doing isn't changing the world. What you're doing is not transforming people. By, you know, hate signs, all this, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look like the gospel. I think we all remember the story. I'm going to have to go a minute over. We'll hurry this up. What was the name of the film that we had that was, uh, oh my, Todd White. There was a great part in there where they talked about, there's a group in LA, there's, there's a place in LA where the drug addicts, the tattoo people, everything, they all gather together once a week. And they started sending, Todd White, some of them started sending people in there to pray with people, to bless people, to love people. They were having a powerful impact. People were coming to the Lord, they were getting free from drugs. I mean, it was, it was a wonderful, redemptive story. One day they were there and nothing was happening. It was just like running into a brick wall. No one, the prayers just didn't seem to get through. And then they noticed there was another Christian ministry there carrying signs. Repent, fags, you're going to hell. The second coming is here. You won't be. I mean, it was this, this anger. And, and their first response was they were going to go there and scald those people. And then the Holy Spirit said, no, those are my people too. So they went over and they talked to them. And they, they said, we're here ministering too, uh, and uh, we're, we're glad to see you. How long have you been doing this? I think it was 20 years. Oh, and how many people have you won? None. Wow. 
Why do we do that? It's... And she, she concludes, and we are done. Reaching out to someone we disagree with is a choice we can all make. And that's the thing that, as we look at these scriptures, this Torah, you know, Yeshua said that nothing will disappear from the Torah, not even a yod. That's the word he used. He says jot. Have you ever seen a yod in Hebrew? It looks like a little upside down comma. It's the tiniest notation in the Hebrew alphabet. And Yeshua said, not even that will disappear from the Torah till heaven and earth pass away. So we know this is what God said. We are to hate evil. We're to remove evil. But we need to have the grace of God to know how to share the message. To know that people are loved. And I, I, uh, Greg mentioned James, and I think it's James, it's James 2, I believe, where James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. But do you understand that if you don't agree with God's law, it's impossible to show mercy because what's wrong? It, everything is right. Everything is in confusion. And it's tempting when you hear a story like hers to say, well, we need to get rid of all religion. This is a lot of people's response. Organized religion is bad. We need to have no rules. And guess what? We need rules. We need restrictions. God's word is eternal. And what we'll notice is when God's people obey his word and walk in it, they experience blessing. But we have a world today that has taken a stand against God's law, and we need to figure out how to reach them. And I think if you have time, go listen to that little talk of hers. I've kind of followed the Westboro Baptist Church for a long time, so you probably haven't. Don't waste your time. If you read their website, you'll be looking for a six sack. But there has to be the ability to love and to share without compromise. And I think through the Holy Spirit we can do that. Let's all stand. Brother Ron, would you close for us, please? Lord, we've been discussing things that are very heavy on our heart at this time, Lord, that we do desire to know your will and your ways. We desire, we desire to carry out your word. And we recognize that you are faithful, and you are just, and you are merciful, and that we learn to walk in that same mercy and grace towards others. We pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide and direct, encourage and strengthen our dedication to you and our de dedication to your service. And we just pray, O oh Lord, your grace and mercy continue to surround us. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.